Welcome everybody. Uh, now we're good to start. Uh, sorry, I will take uh, a few minutes uh, to make the introduction about who we are. Uh, so this is uh, the third webinar of the Lab Quantic. Um, so we started these things uh, about uh, yeah six weeks ago. Uh, very happy to have three uh, very, uh, very distinguished teams of speakers today. So first, what's uh, the Lab Quantic? We're a, a Paris-based not-for-profit. Uh, running a, a range of initiatives uh, in support of the quantum ecosystems worldwide. We started with uh, meetups. Uh, we did a, a couple of high profile conferences and workshops, hackathons on quantum computing and quantum networks. And we have uh, more ambitions, more ideas. We've been constituted as an, uh, an association uh, just very recently. And uh, you'll hear uh, from us uh, very, very soon. So the, the funding members uh, are on the right of this slide. This is Jean-Gabriel, who's with us also today, uh, uh, helping also a lot with the organization. Thank you, Jean-Gabriel. We've got Jean-Christophe Goujon and um, uh, Robert Marino as well, uh, helping uh, with uh, putting together uh, the Lab Quantic. So next slide. Oops, sorry. Uh, to, uh, to answer the question that many of you will ask at some point, uh, I'm pretty sure about that. So the slides uh, that we will present, that will be presented today will be shared. With you that will be available uh, on our website thelabquantic.com uh, also on the meetup website and you get a mail from us uh, probably in two days uh, also we have a replay a video replay of the webinar uh, we have a youtube channel where you can watch it and again same thing you get a mail uh, with all the indications that's um, that's uh, that's pretty useful uh, we have a twitter account a linkedin account as well and I remind everybody that it's really important for a community such as ourselves uh, to, uh, to have as many followers as possible. So Jean-Gabriel did the animation. It's a little bit vintage, like uh, in the 80s or the 90s, but I thought it was, uh, it was looking good nonetheless. Uh, so the community is growing. Uh, subscribe to YouTube, uh, join the group of Bitum, share the news, uh, thumbs up. Uh, so that's, uh, that's really important for us. And uh, by the way, I forgot to mention there were 250 people registered today, which is a record. We're not there yet uh, in terms of participants, uh, but I think we are probably, probably around 150 participants, which is great uh, for people to listen to, to, quantum, uh, to, to experts in quantum technology. Uh, a word uh, that's for if some of you, and that's something we're really interested in, uh, can uh, or feel uh, that they could write a, a post for us, uh, we are preparing a channel on Medium uh, where we will post uh, relatively technical uh, memos, um, notes, or articles, uh, relatively short also, less than 10 minutes reading. Experience shows that's, uh, that's the most useful. Uh, investors like that very much, uh, the public also in general, we want something really uh, original, uh, meaningful, uh, can be a little bit technical. Uh, experience shows that it's really extremely helpful. So, Feel free to, uh, to write something uh, on your own Medium channel uh, and submit to us to our publication. This is called the Lab Quantic, and we'll be happy to publish also an important way for us to create some content and thought leadership. Uh, our next meetup will be on May 12th. Uh, I've got the list of speakers here. Uh, at least uh, you see, uh, we will be mostly, I know that's not true, we, we will get uh, Enrique Solano from IQM uh, Finland and Munich. Uh, so superconducting qubits, uh, Mehdi Namazi from QNECT in the US uh, on uh, quantum communication, quantum repeaters. And we'll have also Samir uh, from uh, M12, which is the corporate venture arm of Microsoft, tell us about investing in quantum technologies. So another great session, take note, it's May 12th, 5 p.m. CET. So we try to do that every two weeks, more or less. Next, uh, and to finish with my uh, introduction, then I leave it to the speakers uh, to present what they're doing. Uh, we've got uh, three uh, presentations today. We'll start with uh, Roman and Enrique from uh, Multiverse, that will talk about quantum computing and uh, quantum-inspired algorithms for finance. Uh, Nathan from the Unitary Fund about open source uh, quantum computing and uh, also about his experience in a not-for-profit, which is really extremely interesting in the US and elsewhere. And uh, Alexander and Mathieu from Kunami, uh, who are co-founders of a startup in, uh, in Switzerland, uh, will tell us about their venture, uh, also what they're building, how diamonds uh, can be helpful, useful uh, for sensing at an adequate scale, which uh, I'm sure for you, for many of you, is a little bit weird as a concept. Uh, and last point I will make is about um, 
the ground rules uh, to use uh, Zoom in a webinar setting. So it's slightly different than Zoom uh, web conferences. Uh, it's a webinar. Uh, there are many people around, so we can't give access to everybody, but everybody can talk. Uh, so all attendees are muted at the start. Uh, if you want to talk, uh, you can raise your hand uh, on the, the chat or uh, I don't remember, or somewhere uh, you can raise your hand. And uh, me or Jean-Gabriel will give you uh, the opportunity to talk after permission is granted. But uh, I think the best is to use the, the Q&A box that you should have somewhere also at the bottom of your, of your screen. It's a good way to interact with the, with the speakers. Uh, you can ask questions anytime, they will answer after the presentation. Uh, you can vote uh, for, uh, for questions, uh, to upvote them and put them uh, on top of the list. Uh, and as much as possible, people will try to, uh, to get an answer to your question. Um, if we are not uh, able to answer all the questions, especially for the last presentation, uh, feel free to ask on Meetup. Um, you can have, uh, yeah, can ask, uh, can inter interact with the speakers however you like, and they will be able to answer the questions later on. So that's it for me. Uh, so I'm Christophe Jozak. I hope I said that at the beginning. Uh, and with my colleagues at the La Quantique, we are very happy to have you here today. And we'll have uh, Multiverse start uh, the presentation with uh, Roman and Enrique. Guys, the floor is yours. Okay. Um, let's see. So let me just um, uh, ba -ba. let me just share the slides. You should all be seeing the slides right now. Can you all hear me? Well, yes. Okay, good. So, um, yeah, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thanks a lot, Christophe, for the invitation to, uh, to this webinar and, and this meeting. I think it's really a great opportunity to explain uh, the work that we are doing. Um, since, uh, well, I'm Romano Rus. I'm, I'm the, uh, the scientific director of Multiverse Computing. Uh, I'm going to be giving the first part of this talk. The second part will be done by, by Enrique Lizazo, who is here, and he's our CEO. And I hope that, well, in this talk, we want to transmit you um, our ideas and our vision of what can uh, quantum computing do for finance, and in particular also quantum inspired computing. So um, I know that, uh, well, according to what Christoph told me, uh, the audience, uh, you guys that are at the other side of the internet, no? so it's uh, very heterogeneous. So um, I want to give, um, you know, very broad talk, uh, giving concepts like not entering into too many technical details, at least when, when it's not required, all right? So um, let's, let's start. Okay, so we are all here because quantum technologies are essentially taking over the world. Uh, I don't have to convince you about that. Essentially, quantum is taking a business leap, as was uh, mentioned in this report. Now, there have been many advances in quantum technologies in the last years, mainly because of the you know, injection of, of private capital from many well-known companies that all of you know about, you know, Google, IBM, Microsoft, and so on. Also different geopolitical regions, such as the EU, United States, and, and China, and so on. So there is a lot of money coming. Um, there are many advances in uh, experiments. Therefore, the field is evolving very, very fast compared to you know, several years ago. And this means that we have to start taking quantum computing uh, seriously, right? Now, uh, in particular, well, what is all this about quantum computing? Um, maybe we should start from here. So quantum computing, um, just long story short, is about uh, using the laws of quantum mechanics to encode information and to manipulate it. So we know that it's possible, I mean, in physics, we've known for many years that it's possible to encode information at the level of atoms, okay, and quantum systems. And by manipulating this information with the laws of quantum mechanics, it turns out that we can do things that otherwise we cannot do with classical laws of, of computation, okay? Um, you know, at the end of the day, um, we realize that this allows us to do calculations that are simply impossible or intractable in, in conventional classical computers, simply because, you know, quantum mechanics is allowing us to manipulate information in a much more efficient way, okay? It's a change of, of paradigm. I always like to, to give this example. This is the typical exa example of why we should all, uh, worry about quantum computing. Imag this is a factoring problem. Imagine that you want to factor 15 equals five times three. This is a very simple example, but if you want to factor a number with 617 digits, this starts to be something difficult, okay? This is a type of um, number that you have to factor if you want to, uh, you know, crack the RSA crypto systems that we are using nowadays. So just for the record, um, 
you know, if you want to use the best classical algorithm to factor, you know, one of these numbers, it's going to take you around 317 trillion years with the best uh, factoring algorithm that we have nowadays. Um, this is a very complicated algorithm. Actually, it takes exponential time in a number of bits. Now, it turns out that if you have a quantum computer that works perfectly well, Peter Shor, um, I think it was in 92, he um, discovered the quantum algorithm for doing uh, factorization. Uh, that is polynomial in the number of, in the size of the input, and well, you know, you will be able to factor this number in around eight hours. So here you can have uh, a glimpse of why quantum computing is important. It's a change of paradigm. You have to think different. There are problems that before you could not solve, and suddenly, well, you know, you have to start thinking about them once again because you can solve them. Okay, and this is not just an academic exercise because you know factoring is interesting also for technology. So um, there are new things essentially that we are going to be capable of doing um, that were simply not possible before. Now, why now? You all know that quantum technologies have been evolving a lot. Uh, there is something called quantum supremacy that I'm sure that uh, many of you um, have heard about it. This was the announcement by Google uh, not so long ago. This was in October uh, 2019, right? Where they claimed that they had achieved quantum supremacy. Well, there is still a bit of controversy, especially with IBM people and so on, but it's true that the advancement was uh, uh, extremely impressive but the point is that you know this is the singularity okay so there is a point we, we just found a problem that apparently classical computers are just uh, very bad at solving it and with the quantum processor that google can build a priori we are able to to solve it uh, much faster efficiently all right so this is just the beginning of a new era we have to start thinking differently we have differently we have to start thinking that well, we can use quantum systems to solve problems that before they were just simply impossible to solve now this is a slide that I, I like to share about um, what is the impact of, of quantum computing technologies according to Gardner. Okay, so this is a typical um, magic uh, quadrant that they build in the, in the horizontal axis, you have the time to market, in the vertical axis, you have the speed up. Um, so you can see that there are already some, well, if you look for factoring here, uh, this is a, still a little bit far away, but you see that, you know, we are not so far from having some uh, applications, um, near term applications that are going to be very relevant. So if you have a look at this, support vector machines. This is everything that has to do with machine learning, uh, classifiers and so on. Um, this is short term, also quantum optimization. So there are things here that are gonna be uh, relevant uh, in the near term, or at least not, not so in the long term as other applications. Of course, people have realized that. I mean, in the last three years, I think there were more than 250 new startups in the world on quantum computing. Uh, and according to Garner, they expect that the global market will reach 13.3 billion US dollars in 2023, okay, which is a lot. So this gives you an idea of, you know, um, things are getting serious and there are applications that are going to be uh, there sooner than later. Now, where can one apply quantum computing? Where well, essentially in any field of science, materials, finance, in chemistry and pharma, optimization, logistics, uh, communications, cryptography. And I always like to say that, um, um, the most important application of quantum computing still needs to be discovered simply because we still don't have the quantum computer there, or at least the, the, the big one, all right? So we'll find new applications in the future that are going to be super relevant, that's for sure. But right now, well, um, these are the ones that we are thinking about. Uh, one that is particularly promise, promising is finance. And of course, there are many people interested here, banks, finance departments, rating agencies, regulators, and, and so on. Now, why do we care about finance? for quantum computing? Well, because it turns out that finance is full of mathematical problems that are very hard to solve. And these are the type of problems that we can solve with quantum computers. Um, you know, finance is a very complex system. We know that economy is just a system of um, many, many, many variables. These variables are highly or strongly correlated, as we like to, to say in physics. Uh, the, the system is highly chaotic. It's very difficult to predict. And well, this is great because, you know, this is the type of systems that we also have in physics, okay? They are, you know, we have many, many atoms, lots of interactions there, nobody understands really what the hell is going on. It's a complex system. So we need to start building tools to, to deal with this type of, of, of systems. And when they are quantumly correlated, then, you know, it's even, it's even worse, okay? So, you know, in finance, there are, um, when you do mathematical finance or quantitative finance, there are lots of uh, interesting algorithms going on. Um, I mean, if you dive a little bit, you find that there are optimization problems. So they have to 
to, to run many optimizations of Monte Carlo simulations to predict, uh, you know, the price of the stocks and price of, you know, of derivatives and lots of things. The stochastic differential equations as well to predict the market. There is also a lot of machine learning uh, to learn the trend of, uh, you know, the, the stocks. Um, and these are exactly the type of problems where, you know, um, quantum computers are very good at because they are very powerful computers are very good using with many variables that are highly correlated. So this is one motivation. The other motivation, and this is more for financial institutions, is that of course, if they can use new algorithms that are more efficient, this, it means that you know, they have uh, more efficiency. It means that they have to use less time to you know, do their predictions. They can also do uh, more accurate predictions. And in practice, in the end, this means that they are able to save more money, all right? So there is a really here uh, an interesting uh, also industry motivation. All right, so let me just give you uh, an example of how uh, quantum computing can be applied to finance and in particular physics, which is a pre prediction of financial crashes. So this is the problem. It's given a financial network in equilibrium if we just do a small change in the prices of the assets, whether this could lead to uh, you know, a small perturbation in a financial network, whether this could lead to a failure or a crack in, in the system, all right? Um, turns out that this problem can be um, written down mathematically uh, in, in very clear terms. Um, this has been done in the past. Uh, and this is, for instance, the type of equations that, that you obtain. This vector B here is a vector of the market values of, of different institutions. Then these institutions have several cross holdings between them, all right, which is represented by this matrix here. They also have some self-ownership of their own institution. Then there are some assets. This could be, you know, oranges, apples, uh, whatever. They have some prices, then there is some matrix that represents the ownership of the assets by the institutions. And then there is a factor here, which is nonlinear, which is called the failure term. And this has to do with panic, which means that when everybody is, is, is in panic and they start selling all, all the, all the, you know, all, all, the, all this, um, um, all the, all the assets and everything starts to be, uh, you know, like in, in this, uh, in these days that everybody was kind of, uh, selling their participations in different companies because of the virus there was suddenly everything there was a panic effect and everybody started selling because essentially um, everybody was selling right so this type of non-linear effect can be modeled in the in the system with a term like this uh, i will not go into the details of what this means but essentially it's a non-linear term and the idea is that in the end one can recast the economic equilibrium condition in this type of equation where the quality is the condition of financial equilibrium and anything that is above this is out of equilibrium configurations. Now finding for a given financial network, finding the configuration of equilibrium is an MP hard problem, all right? It turns out that how to map this in physics. Physics is variable. So okay. some is exactly the type of problems that we find in physics. And we can um, write this as a, uh, as a problem of finding the lowest energy eigen state of a, of a quantum magnet, all right, of a magnetic system. It's a standard optimization problem in physics. Uh, we know very well how to handle with this, but essentially we understood how to rewrite as a physics problem, okay? And once you have this as a physics problem, we can immediately put it on a quantum computer. Um, this is not science fiction. Here is um, the paper where we actually proved it and where we did the mapping. Um, here is a small simulation just to show you how this goes. There are two phases, the normal phase and the crash phase where all the institutions crash. And this is exactly like a phase transition in physics between a normal phase where everything flows, you know, uh, and a crash phase where, you know, you have your train that you just, everything crashes, all right? So here in this, in this plot, I'm just showing the number of failures in the institutions. You go from zero and suddenly there is a, what we call in physics, a first order transition to a phase where essentially everybody's failing, all right? Um, we understood how to describe this as a physics problem and we put it on a D-Wave machine, which is one of the quantum computers that is available commercially together with our friends from, from Bilbao. Uh, you know, the team of Enrique Solano. Um, and these are the type of simulations that we did on, on D-Wave and yeah, it was working fast, uh, fantastically well. So the quantum simulation on D-Wave was essentially producing the same type of values or, or very close to the ones that we were able to, um, to determine classically, all right? 
So, you know, the message that I want to transmit here is that it is possible to pick up problems in finance, the ones that they already have in finance, of course, but also new problems that, you know, people didn't think about them because, come on, this is just too hard. This is an example. And we can just pick them up, translate it into the language of physics, and, well, throw it into a quantum computer, okay? These type of things we can do now. All right, there are many other examples, of course, of problems that um, you can, um, for where, where you, in finance, where you can use uh, quantum computing. Um, if you're interested, I invite you to have a look at this paper. This is a, a reviews in physics that we wrote uh, together with Enrique, who's also here, and with Sam Mugel, uh, who's also one of the, uh, well, he's the CTO of, of Multiverse. Um, I have to say that this review is, uh, I think it's uh, one year old or so, one year and a half, and it's, um, there are already new developments from the, from, the, from the review, but I think it's a good place to start if you want to have a look at what can be done in finance if you have a quantum computer. All right, let's move on. Um, now, the question is, how do we do that? All right, of course, we can use quantum computers. Um, there are different types of problems that you can deal with in quantum computation uh, for finance. There are problems for which we do quantum optimization that essentially means quantum annealing. Here, the typical problem is portfolio optimization. I have a number of assets, um, participations in some companies, let's say, for instance, or I have uh, participations in investment funds and so on, and I have to, um, and rebalance my portfolio in order to maximize the returns in a definite period of time. This is a typical portfolio optimization problem. It's an NP-hard problem, it's intractable again. And well, we can just, it's a canonical application of quantum optimization. We can also do credit scoring. It's possible to recast the problem of, you know, you go to the bank and you want a loan and the bank has to decide depending on your earnings, where do you live, who you are and so on, whether they give you the money or not. So this classification problem, which is a typical problem in machine learning, this you can also recast it as an optimization problem, all right? Also arbitrage opportunities. This is the problem of finding loops in financial networks where you can actually extract a net gain, okay? Finding this type of loops is very complicated. It's also NP-hard, and you can also recast it as an optimization problem. The problem of crash prediction, as I just said, and actually there are many more now. The second trend of algorithms are quantum machine learning algorithms. Here, um, the most important ones, at least in my opinion right now, are classifiers. All the problems that have to do whether you fit into one um, label or another, because from the point of view of finance, this is very useful. You can use them for, for instance, fraud detection. Uh, you know, um, the tax agency just receives all your uh, data and they have to decide whether what you are doing is fraudulent or not. All right. So this is a typical machine learning problem. So here one can do quantum machine learning. All right. Uh, which gives very good solutions already with a few qubits, by the way. Uh, also PCA, principal component analysis, uh, regression. It's possible to um, have quantum algorithms that have a speed up with respect to regressions. Neural networks, you can train neural networks with a quantum computer. You can define quantum neural networks as well. And there are some algorithms here that uh, are actually for optimization, but people normally talk about them in quantum machine learning, which are variational quantum eigen solvers and autoencoders. Um, which are nice algorithms for uh, also finding um, uh, optimal solutions in problems, so optimizations. Uh, last but not least, algorithms that are related to quantum amplitude estimation. This is a whole family of algorithms, but the most important part for uh, all the problems that in some, for instance, in the pricing of derivatives, in analysis of risk and so on. So this is just to give you a glimpse of the type of things that, that one can do with quantum computers in finance. Um, this is the, um, a summary of the type of um, speed ups that one can get in quantum machine learning algorithms. This is uh, uh, by far not uh, exhaustive. You can take a look at this very nice review here um, about all these speed ups. The point with quantum machine learning is that uh, usually when one needs a universal quantum computer, as I'm saying here, it's much more challenging than quantum annealers, which solve optimization problems. And there are still some topics under investigation. So this is still an open field of research by far. So for instance, the issue of the how do you codify the input and the output, what is the optimal number of weights and so on. This is still something under investigation. Now, what if we need something now? And you know, we don't want to wait for quantum computers to be more mature. 
Uh, here there are also some options which are quantum inspired algorithms. These are classical algorithms that are inspired by how quantum algorithms work. Two examples are the digital annealing processor by Fujitsu, which mimics how quantum computers optimize, all right? Another one is the software tool by Microsoft on optimi for optimization problems, which is classical software, but you know, it's built on how quantum uh, systems actually work. Um, and there are also tensor networks. So these type of, of techniques, they are based on mathematical descriptions of highly correlated systems. The typical example of a highly correlated system is a quantum many body state. Uh, they are very well known in physics. We've been doing tensor networks for many years, but they are very new in industry. And we are just started, starting to realize that we can also use tensor networks to do machine learning and optimization in industry, all right? Um, I will not go into the details of this slide, but this is just to show you that in physics, we've been using tensor networks essentially anywhere, all right? Even in quantum gravity and string theory, they have found applications, not just in optimization algorithms, but also in the theory of quantum gravity. And I think that this is very remarkable. For us, the most important bit is this one below here, which has to do with machine learning. Now, the main idea of tensor networks is to pick up highly correlated uh, structures, in particular tensors with many indices, like this one that I'm representing here, and break them into fundamental pieces that you can handle efficiently on your computer, all right? And these fundamental pieces, are essentially the tensor networks, all right? So it's much more efficient to deal with this picture here on the right-hand side, which is a graphical representation of many tensors connected with each other, than with this very big tensor that is on the left-hand side. Now, recently we realized that we can use this trick to, uh, to do improve machine learning algorithms. Here I'm just putting a couple of examples. Uh, this is a very nice paper uh, on supervised learning with uh, tensor networks. Uh, this is a more recent paper from the group in Google where they implemented tensor networks in TensorFlow, okay? And in both cases, they showed that it's possible to uh, speed up uh, some machine learning algorithms, in particular support vector machines by a factor of 100, all right? And in my opinion, this is just the beginning. This is a very promising line of research. And I think that we should, uh, uh, you know, uh, this is a technology that uh, it's really worth exploring in, in industry. All right, uh, and we can implement it right now. So there are again many other examples about tensor network algorithms. I invite you to have a look at this review that I published uh, last year also, where I, there is a specific section on, only on quantum machine, lear on machine learning applications. Uh, but again, this is something that we are developing at the moment. So it's uh, by far not, a, it's an open field of research. All right, so now I'm gonna leave, uh, I'm gonna uh, let Enrique control the slides, um, one second. And um, he will explain you more about the business uh, part of uh, Multiverse. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. I think that we still have five minutes or so just to explain how the company is running and who are the, uh, the team and so on and this kind of thing. So uh, this is the most important slide I have to say. Okay, we, you already know, we are just dealing with quantum computing and finance and so on. And here you have, the brochure that make us famous inside the bank, which is a brochure for my VM telling that, okay, cite, citing us twice in the same brochure about uh, with the review papers that Roman has also uh, comment, uh, just uh, commented briefly before. We have also a seal of excellence from the European Union and so on. We are based both in San Sebastian and Toronto, and we have paying customers, a uh, uh, software service model, and okay, this is a huge, huge, Mark, okay. Uh, we are just closing our first uh, seed round. Market is totally huge, as I have said, okay. 8,000 8 hedge funds, quantitative increasing, okay. In total, the investment funds is 100,000, 25,000 uh, banks, whatever. I, we cannot eat everything here. So, and our idea is here you have some uses of our software. This is uh, just writing here as from the financial point of view, I mean, when we are just going for the for our customers, we try, we have to explain them the optim, optimizing problems or the optimizing solutions we have from quantum computing. We have to translate that in some kind of financial problems, also in machine learning problems or in some other kind of problems. This point, okay, this is, for example, one thing that our customers uh, understand quite well. This is just an example, just applying the Mm, the quantum and um, quantum inspired algorithms, because these are the quantum uh, support vector machine from multiverse. 
inside the problem of credit card, credit card fraud detection. Okay, these are us, these are the rest of the algorithms, and this difference means for a bank the size of the Citibank, about 80 million a year. So this is another way to explain quantum computing in finance, and it's quite simple, for sure. Okay, we have paying customers, this partner, we have their nearly everybody, some other partners, for sure. Thank you very much, Christoph, also, uh, okay. for your support. And this is the team, you already know Roman, and this is me, I can, okay, I have to recognize that maybe this picture is from some years before. And then the, this, our CTO, our uh, 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 marketing manager, and then our CSO, which is Sophia. And okay, this is just a brief comparison. Okay, we have uh, a totally focused on finance, we have knowledge, uh, we uh, have no knowledge not only in science and technology, but also in finance, which is totally important. We have also developed not only quantum, but quantum inspiring, in especially in how tensor networks, and yes, we are in the, in the, uh, in the market. Mm, so far, our funding story has been a kind of a miracle, which just are relying only of a grant of 50,000 and so on, but now we are just closing our net zero RAM, which is a proceed of uh, about a million euros. I mean, composed by 750 key in dilutive, which means just uh, entering the capital, and then and a grant of 250 keys. And we expect a third round on the year. Uh, coronavirus allow that. Okay. And for sure, apart from that, uh, this is uh, the worries. These algorithms are totally scalable. In fact, we have some petitions some that are from some projects that want to apply the same optim, uh, optimizers we are using and the same machine learning in these the classifiers, in fact, to some part of the life science. But this is not our focus, but we are going just to enter that or to allow them to use our algorithms to discover some nice things. And I think that this is, uh, well, what I have to sell in to tell in, in five minutes. So thank you very much again for having us here. Thank you very much, Enrique. And we would have a clap clap or something virtual at this, at this stage. Thank you both very much for, for the presentation. Uh, yeah, maybe just two words from my side. I think that, that's, uh, but that, that's really super interesting that uh, you guys have both quantum inspired running on classical computers that are available now and quantum uh, computing. Uh, for for the future, as far as I, uh, as I can understand, I think that helps bridging the gap from now to to when the, the quantum computers will be available. And uh, just a last word from my side. So uh, I'm working with these guys at the CDL, the Creative Destruction Lab in Toronto. Uh, I think that's a great experience for for them uh, going through it uh, this year. I'm not sure how that works for next session, but it might be that we invite somebody from CDL next time to make a presentation about the program for quantum startups. I think it's a great experience. I'm pretty sure you guys can uh, can confirm. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so we've had a couple of questions as well uh, at this stage. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, there are some, it would be great to have uh, discussions in person. I think, I'm, I'm sorry, we can't have that. There's not enough time and uh, we are way too many. So we are about 180 people uh, connected or even more, 190. So uh, both through Zoom and, uh, and uh, YouTube. So it's great. Uh, so now I, I suggest that we move to the next speaker, Nathan. And uh, Roman and uh, Enrique, if you can answer the question in the meanwhile, I think that would be great. Uh, and please people and uh, attendees, uh, people around, uh, feel free to ask as many questions as you want. The guys are there to answer. And they're not listening to the next talk, so I'm pretty sure. So they can answer your question. So Nathan, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Christophe. Can you hear me well? Yes. Yes. So I will uh, uh, start the presentation. <clears throat> can you see the? Can you see it well? Yes, that works. Okay. So, um, oh, sorry, that's uh, already okay. So I'm going to speak about open source uh, quantum computing and quantum science in general. I would like to thank. Uh, Christophe, uh, for giving me the opportunity to speak about uh, what we're doing at uh, Unitary Fund, which is a non-profit organization that I will uh, speak about that uh, works uh, in open source uh, quantum science and technology. And um, about myself, I would just like to mention that um, I'm a physicist, 
by training, uh, although now I, nowadays I code a lot. And uh, um, I do research on cooperative phenomena in a variety of systems. So you may be not, fam not so familiar with some of these uh, uh, names, uh, uh, such as quasi-particles like polaritons, uh, applications that span uh, from terrorist emission to understanding uh, how <clears throat> specific artificial atoms work. But <clears throat> one of the common threads uh, I, I found in my research, uh, it's really studying cooperative phenomena, not only in physics, uh, but also in science. And I really think that open source right now, it's uh, uh, providing a, a powerful platform for researchers to advance uh, science uh, uh, in a faster way and also maybe in a better way. Um, I will uh, speak also, let me also just mention that uh, uh, a core of my research uh, and also the things I will uh, mention, it's uh, cavity quantum electrodynamics, which is really the quantum mechanics theory uh, at the basis uh, of uh, how quantum computers work than other quantum devices work. And in general, the, the, this is a, a depiction that is showing how we can study not only single, uh, for example, atoms inside the cavities, but um, multiple atoms inside the cavities where uh, light field is confined. Actually, this is when cooperative phenomena occur, stuff like uh, uh, chaotic dynamics uh, or cooperative light emission and absorption, also referred to as uh, uh, super radiance. And this is something that can be modeled with a quantum toolbox in Python, which I will introduce later on, which is uh, an open source library that I help maintain with other uh, volunteers. So open source basics. First of all, what is open source code? Well, open source projects uh, such as Wikipedia allow uh, a community to contribute to the same product or service. And in general, open source software is that software uh, that allows uh, anyone to look inside the source code. That's, that's why it's open source. And that doesn't mean that it can be shared or used without uh, any rule or licenses. But the important thing is that uh, by seeing how professional code is developed and written and improved, not only you can report bugs, but you can become a better developer. And this is especially important if you're not the software engineer by training or uh, your, as your main job. Open source seems to be you know, the opposite of uh, IP protection, but actually it's becoming a very important and powerful platform also in business. And why is that? Uh, I'm collecting here some of the recent acquisitions. Basically, I would like to say that, uh, of course, machine learning, uh, sometimes referred to as uh, artificial intelligence, has been really in the past uh, five to seven years, uh, a really um, a powerhouse that has really driven adoption of open source software. And here, let me just collect the fact that Microsoft has recently acquired GitHub, which is one of the main platforms on which uh, developers can uh, host their code and interact with it, as well as IBM has been uh, acquiring Red Hat, which is an um, open source software uh, developer. Um, there are also flagship programs and, uh, and libraries that's very called, for example, the Python ecosystem, uh, such as Google's TensorFlow and Facebook PyTorch. And of course, in quantum, many will know other examples that I will mention later. So why business really do adopt open source? Well, the reason is that uh, this allows uh, an immediately, immediately a huge crowd of users and potentially uh, bug uh, fixers to interplay with the uh, software. Here, I'm not gonna claim that uh, Python is the only language out there, but certainly it's liked a lot by uh, scientists and especially uh, uh, physicists like me. Here, I'm just gonna show uh, a query of, of, uh, of questions of, on different languages on this uh, forum, Stack Overflow. It's really showing, this was some, some years ago, but it's really showing as a projection how Python has been growing. And I'm gonna speak a bit about Python also because it's central to the quantum computing ecosystem as a language. Python itself is an open source project. And I would um, outline really three reasons why it's become so um, predominant in this field and in general in science. First of all, it allows different degrees of uh, inclusive and interactive communities that organize uh, uh, 
uh, meetups. Now, of course, they've moved online at different levels. So you don't need to be a software developer, developer to join. I recently engaged with the EuroSciPy, which is the meeting of European scientists using Python. And people really uh, encounter the same problems and it's really important to learn from others. The second reason is that Python it's sometimes I can really see it as a user uh, interface more than a proper language that is done for hard coding. Actually, everyone knows that as an interpreted language is not efficient by design. But why is it so uh, much used? Well, the reason is the modularity of the libraries, which are other software packages that can be called at once, as in this network that you will see uh, up here. And a member is the tools, interactive tools that actually have been borrowed by other also closed source uh, software such as Mathematica and MATLAB that allow to interact interactively with code. So here, let me just show you what an interactive uh, Python notebook looks like. It, it is interspersed with uh, uh, instructions in Markdown or for example, with advanced prototyping in LaTeX as well as uh, code blocks. So now we come to why open source coding. It's so important for open science, which is a movement that uh, uh, aims at removing any barrier with regards to the spread and actually the pro production itself of research and science. Well, first of all, it allows with tools like GitHub, GitLab and so on to coordinate, coordinate large and delocalized teams working remotely. And then uh, allows to reproduce results. We actually, you may have heard that we have a crisis of uh, reproducibility in academia research uh, by uh, running after, you know, sensational and, uh, and uh, um, um, outbreaks. It's sometimes hard, especially in uh, biosciences to reproduce uh, uh, with existing data sets um, what has been observed by others. So actually this has been central to the uh, academic community as a topic. Uh, and open source plus cloud services and uh, really structured pipelines allow, um, uh, allow to, to really um, provide a safe uh, um, environment for such results to be re reproduced. And we mentioned that uh, as it has as it been pointed out, pointed out by Gael Varouque, which is one of the maintainers of the scikit-learn uh, machine learning library, not only we are uh, preserving reproducibility of the same data with the same analysis, but with such tools, we also remove uh, the friction that allows to generalize such a uh, process of discovery with different data and with different analysis. And now this is not something related to quantum science. Let me just mention the importance of this and the reactivity, reactivity that this can have in, in a time like this one. Here on the left, you can all see a machine ready um, official repository by the Italian government with data about COVID-19 um, uh, testing and also positive cases. And on the right, you see uh, a platform that has been used by scientists uh, to really study the genomic epidemiology of different uh, strains. So in general, as I mentioned, there are many, many tools that can be used to, to reproduce these, these results and to uh, really make them interactive. And one of them is my binder, which is uh, uh, just one of the many tools that are available in Python for interactive Python uh, notebooks. Another one, for example, is Google Collab, which allows different scientists to work on the same uh, script and of, of notebook at once. And actually these tools are so powerful that some have gone so far as to say that the scientific paper is becoming obsolete in the way that people can share ideas. So I really suggest any scientist that is maybe in the audience to consider uh, adding open source data and also tools that allow to discover that data together with their, with their uh, findings, if it is possible, of course. And if you're a developer, but you're not really sure about how to really approach these from a maker per perspective, I have, a, I have a project which is called the Scikit project and really allows with basically what are the three tenets of open source development to help you uh, go through all the process, process and become um, an open source developer, starting from coding and testing to using already tools that allow already um, 
uh, scan your, your code and uh, automatically build the documentation and then to host it and share it freely and in a safe way. Let me also mention that there are strong arguments against open source software development, and we should be aware of them. First of all, you may have a competitive advantage in science or business. And of course, you may not want to make your, uh, your data or code open source. Secondly, uh, if you're a scientist right now, the, the interests of academia are not aligned with open source software development. Then there is the problem of systematic errors, and it is a time consuming business. And as a maintainer of a large open source software, I can uh, really relate to this. And it is a problem that is really affecting a lot of the scientists that um, uh, are in this, uh, in this endeavor. So for this, let me say that there are some um, solutions and they come also from the fact that the open source software has so much in common with, uh, with science, starting from the peer review of, of code that is uh, basically, in my opinion, borrowed by the scientific methods. And this community is becoming stronger and it's something that is emerging and coalescing around, um, for example, in Python, Numfocus, which is an open source software nonprofit organization, and in quantum science, especially Unitary Fund, for which I work, that really allows to uh, researchers, students, and also people that are, have an interest in quantum science to pursue their projects, as well as other uh, um, gig economy model uh, providers such as Open Teams. Let me just mention what we do at Unitary Fund. So we basically do two things. One, it's the support of ecosystem. Uh, Unitary Fund, uh, funded by Will Zhang, runs a micro grant program, which you can check online and you can apply for. It is a no strings attached program for open source projects. Then it also supports larger affiliated projects in open, open source, such as Qtip or other libraries. And then on the other side, we do perform in-house research using the tools of open source uh, software development. And at the moment, we are on a multi-year program to really study how quantum computers uh, are affected by noise of their environment and how it is possible to reduce, if not to completely uh, expel noise, but to at least to mitigate the errors that affect uh, their functioning. And I would like to mention my co-workers, uh, Will Zhang, uh, Ryan LaRose, and Andrea Mari. Now let's get a bit more to quantum technology with this open source software uh, uh, introduction. And of course, it's not only quantum computing. This is something I wanted to mention here. We have communication, we have simulation, and, uh, and then we also have sensing that the next speaker uh, will, will talk about. And they have different, really interesting uh, potential application. We are at the, at the level, different technology le readiness levels, and um, they are really technology transition uh, stage. Quantum, quantize discrete in chunks. This was introduced by, by Einstein, basically. And here, let me just mention some of these applications starting from experiments. So just imagine having a photon that is, uh, here you can see a box of, uh, of tennis balls that goes through the double slit experiment. And on the right, there is a screen. And basically, we, we keep launching these photons once by one. And basically, what we would observe, we would imagine being it light, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's really, uh, diffraction and interference pattern. But then if we look, we will perform an experiment in a different way, uh, we, we would actually really um, investigate the particular corpuscular uh, nature of light. And this has been, these interference fringes so are really strange to understand. And these are really the uh, atom light, uh, wave particle duality. that not only occurs with photons, but also with uh, massive particles such as atoms, um, molecules such as uh, fullerene, and more recently with organic molecules. So this is just one of examples of how quantum technology is uh, really important even at larger scales. Then we have uh, space quantum communications, for example. Quantum communication is one of the, of the potential secure communication by quantum means it's one of the potential applications. There is already uh, a satellite launched by Chinese researchers that is performing quantum experiments from space. Now we have quantum sensors. I will not uh, turn too much on this given the next speaker topic, but I really want to mention that uh, uh, quantum sensors enhanced uh, science. Uh, it's already been deployed at LIGO and DIRGO, thanks to effects such as squeezing. 
And if you're more interested into this, follow my newsletter online. Now, let me get to quantum computing in the few minutes that are left. And uh, uh, let me mention that uh, one of the main stream approaches to quantum computing is superconducting circuits. This is macroscopic systems, as I mentioned, that are in which we can still witness uh, what would otherwise be in the realm of microscopic physics. Why is that? Well, one of the reasons to look at this is because in the past 15 years, superconducting circuits have been on a really, this is a logarithmic, semi-logarithmic plot on a really an exponential improvement in the fidelity of the qubits. Basically, in the way, the confidence with which uh, um, experimentalists can uh, manipulate if quantum information. But let's not forget that uh, the way information can be encoded on quantum systems is not only uh, on, on superconducting circuits. There are photons, spins, atoms, and also excited atoms such as ions. And so all these different platforms have their advantages and disadvantages. And I think this is a very interesting uh, moment of technology transfer in which we see really uh, a multitude of uh, startups, which are mainly, um, these are just selection of them, a startup which are basically academic spin-offs, also corporate research and development and research centers in academia that are really pursuing these different approaches that have all their advantages and disadvantages. And in this plot, I'm not, in this graphic, I'm not only showing gate-based quantum computing, but also other uh, related kinds of quantum computing or unconventional computing, such as uh, quantum annealing or neuromorphic or photonic inspired uh, 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 computing. And uh, I know that uh, uh, Christoph uh, might be green because Quantonation, which is one of the founders of such uh, endeavors, uh, is invested in some of these, uh, in these companies. So again, these companies and startups really are based on the use and exploitation of the open source to reach the largest possible uh, um, user base and also you know develop developers base as i mentioned before i focus on, on python and most of these libraries uh, have at least a python backend and these are quantum circuit simulators so they they may or may not have a quantum hardware in the that is accessible to the user in the end, we all expect that all of these providers will allow quantum hardware access. So right now, online, you can launch scripts and then we'll perform what, is, what an actuator will do in a lab remotely. And I think that this is very exciting. It is even more exciting from basic science if national labs and research centers would be able to uh, provide such, uh, uh, such uh, models for scientists and developers to uh, tinker with uh, uh, open source quantum computing um, uh, devices. And uh, just, as, uh, just as I was uh, uh, speaking, well, basically in the past uh, few weeks, uh, the Polytechnic in Delft in the Netherlands uh, developed actually a two technology um, cloud-based uh, uh, quantum uh, uh, hardware backend uh, simulator. And actually, you can access both superconducting circuits and spins at the same time. So I find it very interesting. Now getting a bit at a broader scope, like not only quantum computing uh, circuit simulators, but in general, quantum libraries and quantum software. So this is just a collection started from the quantum toolbox in Python to uh, QNET, which were really the precursors and pioneers in uh, of, uh, of some of the things that can be done. Well, it's, it's really a, a broad, broad uh, um, world of things that can be done in physics uh, and information science. So you can check out more details at the Quantum Open Source Foundation website. Let me just mention that uh, some of uh, the, the, the projects I'm more passionate about are large projects. Uh, projects. One is backed by uh, a startup, Sanadu is a photon startup, and one of these libraries is Penny Lane. It's really bringing together machine learning and quantum, uh, quantum computing. And the other one, as I was mentioning, is a quantum toolbox in Python. Uh, what does it do? It does a variety of things. Basically, it allows researchers from quantum optics to, to study what are open quantum systems. So basically, systems that interact with an environment. And this is important. It's crucial for cavity quantum electrodynamic studies. 
It has a variety of other specific studies, but it also allows quantum circuits uh, um, simulation. You can try online with the tools that I just uh, uh, mentioned before uh, to give it a go without installing anything. One of actually the pains of the Python ecosystem is to install stuff, but once you're set up, uh, usually it's, uh, it's a pleasure to, to tinker with it. So you can launch these interactive cloud-based uh, notebooks and uh, uh, start uh, tinkering with, uh, with Qt, which is really the way with which uh, one can really become more proficient in quantum mechanics. And at this point, I really think it's something important to try to master quantum computing concepts. And there are over 60 Jupyter notebooks and tutorials, as well as quantum mechanics lectures on the QTIP website. This is a large project that started in Frank Conori's group, where I also was a, a theory postdoc, and it was led by Robert Johansson and Paul Nation from 2012, and then has moved on to several lead developers that you can see cited here. And it's really uh, a variety of contributors that are actually much more than 44, over 70 contributors. And right now, this is uh, the team of the lead developers. Let me just show here some of the, of the things that you can visualize with, with Qt before, before closing my, my talk. This is uh, the evolution of a, on a block sphere of a quantum bit. Um, this is how you can visualize with really a few lines of code what a quantum cat looks like, a Schrodinger cat. And this is the Wigner function of a, of a Schrodinger cat. And then there is a variety of very field specific uh, tool, tools in this toolbox that allow to study dissipative, that is open quantum systems dynamics, uh, with really specific tools such as master equation solvers in Limblad. Uh, uh, with Limblad uh, uh, operators or Monte Carlo theory and so on and so on, uh, also environments with, with, a, with a memory. There is also quantum simulator uh, part in QTIP. And what I'm really excited about is the recent project that we had uh, supported by Google Summer of Code last year. Hopefully it will be also developed more uh, in, in the coming summer. And uh, really um, props to Boxili, a student at ETH at the time when he developed this. It's a pulse level control of quantum circuits. So you may see in the bottom left what is, the, what is called the intermediate representation of a quantum circuit that you may be familiar with. But really from a physics perspective and you're also from an error mitigation perspective is what, is that, what are actually the pulses that are sent to generate such logical equations or operations. And actually, this is something that we can simulate in Qtip and we can add different kinds of, of tool of noise with this powerful noise simulating uh, toolbox uh, to really try to understand what noise is. And with this, uh, I thank you for your time and I apologize if I was a bit uh, over time. No, not at all. Thank you very much. Thanks, Nathan. Very fascinating, especially the, the last slide, I must say. The rest was fine too. But uh, I like very much what I saw about the, about the tools. I'm pretty sure there are many people uh, in the audience who will have an interest for that. Uh, I think it's a, maybe a debate that we can have some other time about uh, how the people see the evolution of the quantum computing stack, uh, what role for the hardware, for the software companies, middleware, quote unquote, uh, who does what, uh, what for Amazon, Google, all these guys. I mean, it's, um, it's, it's, it's fair to say that it's pretty complex for now and nobody really knows. Uh, but it's going to be interesting to see how things evolve. I'm pretty sure open source will have a role to play there. Um, so there were many links, many interesting things. I think uh, the slides will be shared, as I said, uh, and I uh, encourage everybody also to look at these tools, I think, because uh, open source is, is really going to be crucial for development of quantum computing. So thanks very much, Nathan. Uh, there's a qu couple of questions for you, uh, I think, uh, on the side, if you can have a look a little bit later. And now we'll switch to something very different. Uh, a lot of physics, quantum sensing, uh, beautiful physics, and a, a fantastic company, uh, Kunami, out of Switzerland, uh, will make a presentation about uh, the technology and what they do. Uh, challenge and opportunity uh, for is yours, guys. You need to unmute, Alexander. So, yes, now perfect, super. So let me just start the presentation. Great. So maybe first of all, before we start the presentation, uh, a very big thank you for me on the, to, at first to the organizer, Christophe and um, Jean-Philippe, uh, sorry, Jean-Gabriel, 
who actually just did and put up the whole thing. And uh, I think also thanks a lot all the people listening to that uh, talk. So I'm really excited to give a, a small overview of what our company is actually doing here. Maybe a few words on, about my side. So I'm Alexander Stark. I'm the CIO of Qunami and I'm mostly kind of responsible for the technical part. So it's more like the uh, software and the hardware and the integration of the quantum thing into the, uh, into the whole um, bundle basically to, to get um, in the end, the full instrument in, uh, itself. And together with Mathieu Münch, we will give you um, and walk you through kind of the concepts of our company and also what it actually consists. That's why um, we are talking right now, not about quantum computers by itself, but we are going to talk about quantum sensors. So, and before um, really, or maybe just diving directly into this subject, um, I would like to uh, share with you kind of this view. Let me just uh, close that. Okay. Um, so in my view, um, the, the quantum computer, actually what it is right now desc described is kind of, or I can imagine it being the quantum brain or the brain kind of the capacity. So you really need to, to have a very, uh, well, a very good computational device. It's really essential in the event, in, in the end, to um, perform a lot of, um, or to solve a lot of problems. But there's also another thing which you actually need. So, and these are sensors. So, you know that this is kind of the complementary part, as I see. So, you need to be able to sense the world. And so for that, you can also use um, quantum sensors with that. And the interesting part about this quantum revolution is that. Um, with this quantum character, you will get what people kind of say this quantum advantage. And for me, the quantum advantage in this uh, quantum computer domain is the high processing speed. If you now go to the uh, quantum sensor, and the quantum sensor will give you a very high sensitivity in the end. So, but one thing maybe to mention before, or the disadvantage, what you kind of have about this high sensitivity can be quite, you know, a double-edged sword. Because um, the thing with, which we are actually using in, in QNAMI, so the fact that these quantum states are extremely, extremely sensitive, that is a big, big kind of course for the uh, quantum computational guys, because they want to get rid of this noise, the one read to protect it. So in our case, we really leverage on the fact that um, we can use these sensitivity or these um, very extraordinary um, fine part of this quantum system to sense the world around us. And you now let me store, start here before uh, really diving into that um, system more with semantics, you know, that um, kind of to give you more the overview what people are understanding at first about quantum sensing. So quantum sensing, you can understand in three different ways or three different categories. At first, um, you can think about a quantum object, um, which is measuring a classical quantum property. In the end, it's um, basically you need to have a quantized energy level. And as an example for that, a, a single electron transistor is uh, such a device or potentially also an, a squid is the same thing. Then there is another device uh, which you can use for quantum sensing, and these are um, exploiting the quantum coherences for that to measure um, physical quantities. And one kind of very uh, famous representative for this is the single spin or atom like structure. And the third one is um, kind of almost like at the bottom of uh, the quantumness, and it uh, uses the quantum entanglement. And this quantum entanglement improves mostly the scaling of the sensitivity, which goes even beyond classical means, and which provides you exactly these extreme sensitivities and um, which, which we are all talking about. And my talk mostly will be related to this aspect of being a single spin system. Good, so well, if we have now a notion about quantum sensing, now you would also ask, well, what is the quantum sensor? So what is the device of? And obviously um, there is the, the paper also out from da David Di Vincenzo who, who kind of stresses out what a quantum computer is. 
there is a, a very similar um, well definition of what a quantum sensor is. And the very first, uh, the, the first three aspects will be, I guess, quite similar to you guys, because um, the first thing is uh, you need to have a discrete energy level, which is separate you know, by a certain energy. Then you need to be able to initialize the state in a very defined way and read it out. And you want to coherently manipulate that system. Now, the fourth category is kind of um, unique for the quantum sensor because you need to have the ability to interact with the system and with, uh, oh, well, it's not with the system, but you need to interact um, with the environment with your system. And you might ask, how can I do that? And in order to do that, there are specific protocols uh, in place. So a lot of people have established now a great variety of protocols. And these protocols are actually manipulating the, uh, the spin in such a way that you can shape the quantum sensor to be receptive to specific types of environment. So it's, you can really think about it as a as a filter function, you know. So you can really shape your interaction and select the various interactions or the various interaction um, bandwidth you're interested in. And at the same price or at the same time, suppress also the, the parts which you are not interested in. Now, if you want to have a quick overview about the um, technology itself, so uh, here I listed some classical sensors with, um, versus quantum sensors. You quickly, quick, quickly realize that um, quantum sensors are giving you a much greater performance in terms of sensitivity. And this is kind of what the graph shows you all. So you see there, is all, there are a lot of data points, but um, maybe let me walk and walk you through these graphs. So at the top, you see these uh, classical sensors, and you see that uh, by going further downwards um, with quantum sensors, you can vastly improve sensitivity. And well, why do you want to improve sensitivity? It, it makes kind of sense to ask this question. It's very simple because uh, you want to measure small quantities. But maybe you even don't want to measure small, small quantities. If you have high sensitivity, that means you can even measure, uh, you can also measure this quantity fast. So this is something what you can really you know, have as a trade off. The next point, what you have with these sensors is and this is an, an, a very important question is their size. So that means um, the tight confinement of these sensors determines the type of resolution on this uh, in the spatial domain, what you have. And our sensor, what we are talking about, is kind of here highlighted with, these, um, with this error, which we will, will be sitting there. And just this, um, that there's another error, this blue error, which uh, indicates the sensitivity for one mu b. Just to give you an idea, this is the, um, the sensitivity you would require to, to measure one electron. It's kind of to give you the benchmark here. Well, we are using in Kunami quantum sensors, which are based on diamond. And diamond itself has really unique properties. It's, it's just astonishing what you can get out of this extraordinary, um, extraordinary material. But of course, we do not use diamond in its, um, well, in its pre, uh, pre mature form, carbon. We really use kind of the, the nice and shiny character here. And well, you are definitely familiar with these uh, really nice and great you know, gift of nature. But if you look now into these diamonds um, with a confocal microscope, basically, if you just shine light in them, you'll quickly realize, well, they, these diamonds appear quite clear from the outside, but actually they are quite dirty. So they have, they have a lot of spots in them in the fluorescent microscope. And that's actually the beautiful fact what we are utilizing here. So these, um, these small spots, what you see here are the defect centers in diamond. Mm -hmm. And eventually this is the part which gives um, diamond uh, its color. So, I mean, the, these defect centers also called color centers literally give the diamond its specific color in various, various way. And we in Kinam use a specific type of color center, which you see on the right. So where you just replace a carbon and, um, or two carbon atoms with 
a vacancy, so nothing, and the nitrogen atom. And this compound is called nitrogen vacancy center and gives us super great um, properties, which we will now exploit. Good. Um, uh, well, maybe before uh, going into the, um, the, the description of the level scheme, here you see that uh, we are using these diamonds as small magnetic field sensors in the end. And how and why? Well, you will see it right now. So let get a, let's get again back onto the definition of the quantum sensor. So we said it needs to have discrete and resolvable energy levels. And on the left, you see a very simplified version of our um, diamond center, of, our, of the ND center. And now the beauty, beautiful thing in the center is if you shine green light into that, you will get a red response. So this is kind of just the way of um, interacting with the sensor. And the next thing is these, this red response, the amount of photons will vastly be determined by the quantum state. So these are the spin states in which, are, in which is this quantum sensor. So that means if you are in these um, spin levels plus or minus one, you will get less photons and compared to the other spin levels where you get no more photons. And now what you can do is you can sweep through these um, spin levels or you can search for them with micro fields. Um, and you see, well, while you're shining light into that and you're starting to sweep the microwave frequency, at some point you really hit the transition. And if you hit the transition, that means you can swap the population from zero to plus minus one. And that gives you a dip in your fluorescence. This is exactly what the graph shows you there. And you can also verify, and then you can use that if you select this transition to perform oscillations. So it's these Rabi oscillations, how they're called. And that's, that's the example how to coherently manipulate um, a quantum sensor. Now, um, you want also to think about, well, how does the thing now interact with the environment? Well, the cool thing is if you apply here a magnet to that, these levels are splitted. And this level and the splitting you can directly detect, you see it on the, on the top of graph there, that these uh, levels are visually different now. And of course, what you can do is you can now do this for various amount of magnetic fields because the spin, what we have is susceptible to magnetic fields. And in the end, you will get such a graph, basically, um, such a level structure in the end. And the beauty about that, it's calibrated by nature. So the constants, what you see there, this two a gamma and V, um, these factors are basically factors which are fundamental constants. So you do really not need to uh, calibrate that. So everywhere on, in the world, it's, it has the same number. So you, are, you have a very robust and accurate sensor and very reproducible. And now think about the case that if you scan over a specific surface, a very small surface, then you can really map out the magnetic field of the surface. And this is kind of exactly relying on this technique by just tracking these resonance dips along and translating them um, into the dis differences, you know, the differences between uh, how, how uh, far different they are from the, um, from the very lowest peak there. And that is the very basic principle of uh, Qunami. And this we utilize in our, um, we packed that basically together, this whole knowledge into our whole design. So this is the Protoss Q, what um, offers you um, the possibility of having such a quantum uh, device. It used it use this quantum sensor. So you see this um, in the top right, this is our diamond, which we fabricate and it contains one of these sensors. And this sensor goes into our microscope and this microscope, which is, um, well, here we part into for Riba, a super great um, and very powerful and manufacturing for the uh, AFM base platform. And together with them, um, we kind of build up uh, this, uh, this base platform and we from Konami equip also it with other parts, uh, the MicroFQ, what you see, it's kind of these um, electronic box you see on the right. 
And you might remember that you need to, to select specific uh, measurement protocols, you know, to select specific uh, dynamic ranges. That is exactly done with that. And obviously you also need software to, to connect all these bits and pieces together to exploit this quantum technology. And maybe a one word on the software here, because I think it's quite also interesting to a lot of you. We are relying uh, on an open source approach here um, so that the customers can really uh, alter and see how it is really going and how it's really working. So the, the, the code what uh, we are using as a basis uh, from QD, and on, on top of that, uh, we are building kind of the soft, software platform itself. And just to give you a comparison, you know, in terms of, uh, in terms of performance, um, on the left, you see these advanced light source. Um, and this advanced light source is nothing else than a synchrotron. And you would kind of need a synchrotron to have the same capabilities as what now quantum technology can offer. And I think this is super powerful in the end. And since now it becomes to a tabletop solution, it's, uh, it's, it's really now exciting. Maybe a very quick uh, overlook um, over about the, um, an example from my side about the uh, synthetic, uh, about the sample, what we can measure. So I mentioned already that we placed this, uh, this diamond uh, or our sensor in a diamond tip. Now what you can do is you can really scan over a surface and measure tiny magnetic fields produced by a magnetic material, which is here called these synthetic antiferromagnetic magnetic materials, which are quite interesting right now for the customers in terms of magnetic memory, magnetic storage. For, these are just uh, three different pictures I would like to share with you uh, what our uh, instrument is, go, uh, is uh, able to do. So they are kind of just different measurement modes and they hi highlight different features of, these, um, of this um, of the sample. And there are, of course, many more to that. So I don't want to go into the detail of this, but I'm at this point super excited to have you now the, uh, the possibility really to interact with our customers and they provide us with samples and we work to them to expand our catalog and really to see where we can really apply this quantum system here. And I would, I would say now at this point, um, I would like to hand over to Mathieu, who will tell you more now about what Kunami is doing and how we can, or how we can use some maybe of these samples for industry application, which might be also quite relevant. So Mathieu. Thank you, Alex. Um, I hope everyone here hear me. Um, I had a bit of problems in, in, in hearing you from time to time. So it could be that my connection is not ideal. So if something goes bad, you just time me out. Um, sharing my screen right now. All right, so you should see the next slide. Mm -hmm. Yes, that works. Cool. All right, so... Um, on, on, on Alex, I just wanted to, to take the opportunity to present the team a bit more and, and, and what we're at. Uh, with some people uh, that you have on the rights, that's how we look uh, these days. Um, normally we look a bit more you know, professional, but well, time is, uh, is what it is. But you can still see that some of us are doing some stuff for, for around electronics on the top left. Some are doing some Excel spreadsheets, some are doing some clean room work. That kind of gives you um, an idea on, on, the, on, on the coverage that we have and, and that we're building here via a full stack solution to bring this quantum advantage right into the hands of the, of the users. Um, the roots of the, co of the company are um, based in, in Basel in Switzerland. That's where uh, we're located. And it has to do with the work of uh, the young professor, Patrick Maletinsky, maybe some of you know him. Uh, he's leading the quantum sensing group. And he's uh, nanoscale imaging with this new type of diamond in probes, etc. It was really the core idea at the very, very beginning with Kunami. And, uh, um, and quite quickly, around this idea that there might be a first market 
uh, associated with supplying scientists with these type of sensors um, because he was actually facing increasing demand for collaborations. We assembled a small founder team, four different people, a bit of business uh, acumen, a bit of software expertise, a lot of material science as well. And, and we figured the way forward for Qunami, which is to try and do uh, quantum sensing, but not just for, for moving science. We want to really uh, advance and so problems which are out there in the, in the real world, um, meaning here industry problems, problems in the healthcare. Basically, we want to change the power to impact the, the world uh, with that. So um, if, if I can how it, I'd like to summarize uh, who we are. The Sharp Foundations that I think you got a quick grasp on now through the presentation of, of Alex. Um, also important to us is, is, uh, is human connections. It's, it's literally everywhere uh, within the team for sure. Um, but it's all about human connections in the end. Our users are important to us. Uh, we keep on partnering to achieve this, to achieve that. Uh, we have investors, including the nation, backing us up and, and giving us some, some uh, momentum to move forward. So it's all about a human story that we're uh, trying to build here. And the last value is really this scientific free climbing. It's, it's about going where people have never been before um, with, you know, some, some, some roots, some, some science, not just, you know, randomly and not really knowing what we're doing. All of, all of those aspects we try and, and, and bring together um, into the, the vision for the company, which is to <clears throat> bring quantum sensing across different uh, segments. Um, why that? I think Alex um, made a clear point that a quantum sensor can provide decisive advantage in terms of sensitivity. And if you think and start and think about industry challenges out there, uh, you figure that this sensitivity problem is, is widely spread. Uh, in electronics, um, you need to be able to debug uh, chips which are getting smaller and smaller and smaller and even smaller than that. Um, in imaging, there's a whole question around can we detect with better precision smaller things so that we can maybe diagnose earlier uh, than when it's too late. Um, in, in integrated sensors, like in the automotive, for example, it's also a question whether you can feel a bit better the environment uh, around you. Uh, one example is, is autonomous driving, where you'd better uh, trust your computer that he's going to keep you on the road. And for that, uh, again, good sensors are, are required. As of today, we're definitely starting somewhere. We're not spread all over the place yet. Um, but we have now launched this first product for, for a scientific uh, market. So it's the QNAMI Produce Q. It's a, it's a microscope, uh, a scanning NV magnetometer. It allows people to look at details on their sample uh, with and what they measure is magnetic uh, signals or small currents. Uh, and we are thinking to extend that even beyond. Now, the, these, these problems that the, the researchers are, are having are quite fascinating and they also are relevant to the industry. And the industry we're talking is called spintronics. I'm sure some of you know that very well. Some of you might never have heard about the, world, the, the word. It's just doing electronics with the magnetic properties of the electrons. And this is really, really getting important in, in more than more um, roadmaps where we're trying to think how on earth can we still improve uh, chips, products, uh, devices, electronic devices, when we're all knowing that we approach the end of, of, of the Moore's law with the, the standard silicon technology. And one of the keys to different properties. So Spintronics is definitely a prominent uh, candidate for, for moving in this direction. So we're starting now to see interest from, from quite large companies into figuring out 
what's going on around those quantum senses. Can you, can you maybe have a look at that sample? Can you maybe help us a bit in this direction? So this is now what we're trying to, to look into. So the, the long-term view, um, to, to wrap it up, is, is to kind of become this, this quantum sensor company that, are, uh, that, that is providing support to users. And, and we're really thinking of this uh, from the design to the solution um, because quantum sensor um, as the entire quantum technology brings a certain level of complexity that users or even companies that would like to develop new uh, technology are not always prepared to face. So we are here to help understand the problem, design the solution, and also manufacture uh, a part of that. I thought I'm going to have this, this one uh, final slides around, around the, the value chain of quantum sensors, uh, how we see it, and what are the, the, the associated challenges. So I, I try to simplify that as a maximum, and I'm going to remove some screen to see it entirely. All right. So you, you start with, uh, in our case, the production of, of uh, wafers, uh, diamond uh, in our case. Then you have a lot of activities around engineering that, that diamond. We need to put the quantum sensor in there. We need to shape uh, the diamond in a certain way. It's a very similar business silicon industry that is, uh, that is engraving some device, some, some uh, devices. And then there is a packaging activity to connect all of that, put all the lasers and electronics that you need. Um, and then there is the application. And, and for that, you essentially need to have market understanding and you need to build a software uh, that uh, runs your uh, standard. sensor. And while I think, so, so the value creation that you see here is quite interesting to, to have a look at, but it's, it's, it's really rudimentary numbers uh, at this stage. Um, while we have kind of an understanding of what's the value creation here, there is still a lot, lot of questions around what's the value creation in, in the application part of it. And that is, of course, by essence, uh, due to the fact that it's going to depend on the application itself. Now, I'd say for, for QNAMI as a, as a young company, um, we have certainly clear value that we can add in certain specific parts of that value chain. And I'm thinking on, on the engineering of the quantum sensor, uh, and I'm thinking on the application as well, because we have met quite a lot of people out there bringing us problems, uh, bringing us questions. Uh, can we solve this? Can we solve that? Uh, so we think uh, we can take an active role in this, in this supply chain. Now, this is the, the challenge that we're facing. In order to deliver a solution, we need to be and look around as well. And this is just the beginning. I think, Mathieu, the connection is really bad on your side. All diamond producers, not the ecosystem. You don't have competition in this environment. It doesn't matter. Okay. Um, let me know if you hear me. I'm going to just count. One, two, three, four, five. Well, it still works, but it's cutting pretty, uh, pretty often. But you, you just have one or two minutes left, I said. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm all done. Um, so, yeah, th I think that's where I'm going to leave it. There are really a, a question. There, there is a couple of challenges for us. Some are very much related to the startup and the, and the ability to grow as, as a startup. The do's are not unique to, to what we're doing. I think what is a bit more unique to, to QNAMI and, and, and the quantum startups, maybe in general, are, are questions around the ecosystem and, and how to educate the market about what we're doing and how it can, it can help. So I think this is, my, uh, this is my last slide. Let me just check. Yeah. Oh, no. And a last important one. Please join the movement. Um, there's lots of, uh, of, of startup uh, raising from here, from there. Um, so there's a lot of opportunities, and including us. We are offering positions right at the moment, and we have plans for the next month and the next years. So we're keeping uh, growing. So if you're, if you're interested, you should, you should definitely have a look at our, at our web page. They are regularly updated open positions uh, to join to join the team, and that's it. Thank you very much, Christoph. Thank you all.
Thanks, Mathieu. Thanks, Alexander, for a great presentation. It was definitely very interesting to see a, a different uh, type of, uh, of technology, very different sector, different problematics also that you're facing than the others. And I think uh, it has to be clear for everybody that it's not to meet up on quantum computing only. I think that's quantum communication, quantum sensing, it's even shorter term, and, and it's really good to have these, uh, these discussions. Um, so we might try now to take a, a couple of questions live. Uh, if that works, we never we never tried it before. But uh, if there are some people who have a, a pressing question, I'd like to answer to have it answered live. I mean, uh, I think you need to raise your hand or something like that. Mm, must be a way to do it. Um, so I don't think I see anything uh, at this stage. So we passed hour and a half. Uh, it's been great. Thank you very much, guys. Uh, it's been a great presentation. Everything will be posted online the video tomorrow and, uh, and the decks. Uh, thank you and see you all for our next uh, meetup, which is on the 12th of May, uh, 5 p.m. Just let me, let me stop you. We have one question on the Q&A. So I think the best uh, thing would be for Roman to answer it live. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe that's more efficient than just writing if we are um, closing. Um, so let me first read the question, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, could you please explain how you're using tensor networks in multiverse computing? Well, um, good question. Thanks. Thanks for the question. So we are we are using tensor networks um, to do two things. First, to uh, build optimization algorithms, um, and the second, to build machine learning algorithms. So, um, so optimization is pretty clear. So we use optimization algorithms for the um, you know uh, in physics all the time with tensor networks. There are lots of examples there. What we are doing is, you know, inspired by this, we are using tensor networks to solve complex optimization problems. And then the second thing is that we are building um, um, machine learning algorithms such as classifiers based on tensor networks. It turns out that there are some structures that you can um, model more efficiently through tensor networks and you can optimize more efficiently also. And yeah, that's what we are doing. I mean, you can take a look at these uh, couple of papers that I mentioned in my, uh, my talk, and there you can get an idea of, of how this goes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I think we're good. Uh, thank you all. I see you all on 12th of May, 5 p.m. Uh, a great meetup again. The, again, great presentation. And have a great evening or morning, wherever you are. And uh, see you very soon. Thanks to our speakers. It's too bad we can't uh, applaud, but because <laughs> of the applaud. And see you very soon. Bye bye. Thanks, Christian. Yeah. Bye. Thanks a lot. Bye bye. bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Bye.